All right, Ninja Nerds, in this video, we're going to talk about the third cranial nerve or the oculomotor nerve. So what we're going to discuss in this video is we're going to talk about the origin of the nerve, where you can actually find the nucleus of this nerve, what structures are surrounding it within the brainstem, course of the nerve. So we're going to talk about what structures that actually might pass by, certain vessels, certain dural sinuses, certain holes within the skull. And then we'll talk about the many structures that it's supplying and the functions of those structures. And then we'll finish off a little bit of tidbit on clinical correlation, specifically about Weber and Benedict syndrome, and then some other certain situations too. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So first off, where can we find the third cranial nerve? Well, before we actually look at it in this large structure here, I want to take a look at it from the anterior view. So I want to imagine that you guys are looking at me, you guys are looking at my brainstem. This is exactly how we're going to see it. So we're seeing here the anterior view of the brainstem, and I'm taking a slice, an actual section of the midbrain, and we're looking at it from the top, all right? So this right here is midbrain. Now, so here you have a tiny little canal, it's a little cerebrospinal fluid uh, containing canal right here in the center. That structure there is called the cerebral aqueduct, okay? So it's actually superiorly connected with the third ventricle, inferiorly connected with the fourth ventricle. Surrounding it, this uh, reddish color here, is going to be what's called the periaqueductal gray matter. Okay, so it's very important for certain autonomic functionings, right? So again, this is the periaqueductal gray matter. <clears throat> on the sides of it, on the sides of it is actually going to be the nucleus of the third cranial nerve. So right here, you're going to see here the nucleus for the third cranial nerve. Now, on the sides of it, it's also going to have parasympathetic neurons. So right here next to it, I'm also going to have parasympathetic neurons. Let's draw these ones here in this blue color. So these right here on the sides, these are going to be the parasympathetic neurons that are moving with the oculomotor nerve. Now, they give a, spe a special name to these nuclei right here, these blue nuclei. They call it the Edinger, Westfall, Nucleus. And the Edinger Westfall nucleus is the parasympathetic nervous system nucleus, okay? So it's can containing parasympathetic fibers that are going to supply what's called the ciliaris and the iris, and we'll talk about that, okay? Now, just a little bit of other uh, neuroanatomy here. Anterior to this, we're going to have this kind of little special structure right here. This structure here is consisting of descending corticospinal fibers. So this is consisting of descending corticospinal fibers. This is actually called the crux cerebri. And this is consisting of descending corticospinal fibers, motor fibers. Now, here on the sides, over here on the sides of the parasympathetic fibers, so this parasympathetic nucleus right here, there's going to be this green sets of fibers, green sets of myelinated axons here. And this is carrying up sensory information from proprioception, from touch, fine discriminative touch, maybe even a little bit of pressure. This structure here is called the medial lemniscus. And then the same thing over here, medial lemniscus. Now, in the posterior part here, in the posterior part back here, there's going to be a special structure here that controls your reflexive eye movements with response to your visual stimulus, your visual fields. That structure right there in pink is actually called the superior colliculus. So it's called the superior colliculus. There's one below which is the inferior colliculus, which controls your reflex of eye and head movements with response to auditory stimulus. Okay, so medial lemniscus here on the sides, crux cerebri with the descending corticospinal fibers anterior to it, and there's another structure which is just anterior to that. Let's do this one right here. Right here we're going to have another structure. This actually would be perfect if I would have drawn it red, but whatever. This right here is called the red nucleus, okay? This right here is called the red nucleus. So that's the red nucleus, and the red nucleus actually has descending fibers that actually do cross. They're, they provide contralateral fibers that go to the muscles for limb flexion, most com commonly distal limb flexion. All right, so where do we find the actual third cranial nerve, or the oculomotor nerve? Posterior to it, is going to be the superior colliculus. On the sides of it is the medial lemniscus. Anterior to it is the red nucleus, and then anterior to that is the crux cerebri. So this is exactly where we're going to find the third cranial nerve. All right, sweet, so we see it in this view. And then what's going to happen is, these fibers are actually going to pass, a little bit might pass through the actual red nucleus, 
and then they'll move out through this little cerebrospinal fluid-like filled cavity here. Here in the center, this is called the interpeduncular fossa right here. It's consisting of cerebrospinal fluid. And again, what fibers are going to be moving with it? The parasympathetic fibers. Okay, the parasympathetic fibers. All right, sweet. So we know exactly how it's exiting from the actual brainstem or the central nervous system. So let's go ahead and look at it now at this level. So again, what structure would we have back here? We would have the superior colliculus, and then what would this one be? This would be the inferior colliculus. The reason why I'm telling you this is because the third cranial nerve is found at the level of superior colliculus. The fourth is found at the level of inferior colliculus. Okay, so again, which one was this? This was the third cranial nerve. But to be very, very specific, these fibers here that are coming out, these black fibers, these are your somatomotor fibers, or in specifically, these are your, I'm gonna write it like this here, these are my GSE fibers. Somatomotor fibers are general somatic efferents. They supply some of the extraocular eye muscles. The reason why I'm mentioning that is, we said that there was parasympathetic fibers that move with it. These fibers, these neurons, are actually going to be GVE, general visceral efferent, which are parasympathetic fibers. Okay. Now, what structure is it actually passing by as it moves through? <clears throat> a little bit of neuroanatomy here, nothing crazy. <clears throat> There's actually some more structures here. So you know you have what's called the vertebral arteries. They come up through the transverse foramina within the cervical vertebrae. As they come up, they come together and form what's called this bacillar artery. And then the bacillar artery actually comes off and gives off what's called the posterior cerebral arteries, which become a part of the circle of Willis. Also, it gives off another branch here, which is called the superior cerebellar arteries. So superior cerebellar arteries. And then there's even more. There's anterior inferior, uh, anterior, inferior cerebellar arteries. We're not going to go into all of this. What I want you to know is the third cranial nerve is actually going to run under the posterior cerebral artery and above the superior cerebellar artery. Same thing with these parasympathetic fibers. They're going to move under the posterior cerebral artery and above the superior cerebellar artery. All right, so now that we know that, what will we see right here? What will be above? This would be the posterior cerebral artery and below it would be the superior cerebellar artery. Simple as that. Now, where do these fibers go next? This was the first place, right? So they go in between the posterior cerebral and superior cerebellar. Then from here, there's this special dural sinus. You know dural sinus? You know there's what's actually called the dura mater? Actually, before I, well, no, let, we'll stay here for just a second. There's two parts of the dura mater. One is called the periosteal layer, and one is called the meningeal layer. You see this green layer right there? This green layer right here is actually called the periosteal layer of the dura mater. That's a nice green color there. Then, this pink one right here, this pink one right there is actually called the meningeal layer of the dura mater. Okay, the meningeal layer of the dura mater. What happens is there's a dural sinus here. You know what, you see how this meningeal layer separates from the periosteal layer? Just kind of has that little separation there and there's a blue structure right there. This blue structure is a dural sinus, and that dural sinus is called the cavernous sinus. It's called the cavernous sinus. Now, another way to look at the cavernous sinus is to look at it from a different view. So what I have up here is you're gonna see what's called the cella tersica of the sphenoid bone. That's where the pituitary gland sits. Not your testicles, these are not testicles, these are the pituitary gland. So again, this is the cella tersica of the sphenoid bone. And then you're going to see over here, you're going to see these little uh, kind of like little indentations here where these blue structure is. That's the cavernous sinus. But you're looking at it from like a posterior view. What happens is there's an artery, a very, very important artery, that runs up through this structure here. And this is called the internal carotid artery. And again, you'd have one here. This would be the left. You'd also have a internal carotid artery coming over this way. That's moving through the cavity. So the internal carotid artery is moving through the cavity of the 
cavernous sinus. There's actually another nerve that's moving in this vicinity too. It's called the sixth cranial nerve, the abducens nerve. Now, the reason why I'm saying that is because the oculomotor nerve, cranial nerve three, runs within this lateral wall. Okay, so it runs within these lateral walls of the cavernous sinus. And if you really want to know, the fourth cranial nerve runs right underneath it. And then there's actually another division, which is called the uh, uh, ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve. So the ophthalmic division runs right underneath it. And then there's another one, which is the maxillary division of the trigeminal nerve. And that runs right underneath it. Okay? So where's the third cranial nerve actually running? It's running within the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. And again, just to be clear here, this is uh, called the foramen lacerum. This is called the foramen lacerum. And what happens is this internal carotid artery actually comes from the carotid canal and then moves upwards through the cavernous sinus. So if you really wanted to know, there'd be another structure here, another bony canal that it actually runs through right here. And this bony canal is actually called the carotid canal. All right, so where does this sucker move? This third cranial nerve is moving through here. It's moving within the lateral wall. Suppose it's moving within the lateral wall and it's coming out here. And again, what fibers are moving with it? The parasympathetic fibers. The parasympathetic fibers are moving with it. And it moves through the cavernous sinus, all right? So it exits out or it comes out through this cavernous sinus. Okay, these are the parasympathetic fibers and the somatomotor fibers. So if you really want to be specific, these are the GSE fibers in black, and the blue are going to be the GVE fibers. Okay, so now what happens? They move out of the cavernous sinus, and then they go through a hole in the skull, which is called the superior orbital fissure. So what is this hole right here called? Superior orbital fissure. All right, cool. So now what happens is these somatomotor fibers and these parasympathetic fibers move through the superior orbital fissure and into the actual back of the orbit. But from this view, it doesn't do it justice how exactly it's actually moving through. We'll go over and see it from another view in a second here. What happens is once the actual oculomotor nerve moves through the superior orbital fissure, it gives off two branches, okay? One is called a superior branch and the other one is called the inferior branch, okay? Now, if you really want to know, because I know you guys do, the parasympathetic fibers particularly move with the inferior branch. They particularly move with the inferior branch, and then what happens is these parasympathetic fibers come off the inferior branch and they go to a ganglia. They go to a ganglia. What, what is the definition of a ganglia? A ganglia is a group of cell bodies located within the peripheral nervous system. So those cell bodies there are postganglionic parasympathetic motor neurons. From here, they're going to come out, and they're going to go and supply the iris, specifically the sphincter pupillae, and they're going to supply the ciliaris muscle and cause the ciliaris muscle to contract, which alters the shape of the lens, particularly making the lens very globular, okay? And when you make the lens globular, that's actually going to be for very close vision, okay, or, or near vision, if you will, all right? All right, cool. That's that part. And again, just again, what is this ganglion here called? This is called the ciliary ganglion. Okay. Now, what happens is the superior branch of the oculomotor nerve is actually going to supply mainly two different structures here. We're going to see it better in another, another view here in a second, but look what happens here. Superior branch gives off fibers that supply this muscle right here, okay? This muscle here is a really cool muscle. It actually connects to, we should actually be very, very particular here. There's actually a structure here called the tarsal plate, which has the tarsal glands near it, right? So the tarsal glands. So right there is called the tarsal plate. And what happens is this muscle connects to the tarsal plate, as well as with the orbicularis oculi. This right here, this muscle here, is called the levator palpebrae superioris, okay? Elevates the upper palpebra, or the superior palpebra. The oculomotor nerve superior branch supplies that. There's another muscle here. You see this one right here? This muscle right here, I'm gonna denote it SR for superior rectus. 
The superior division also gives off fibers that supplies the superior rectus. What is the function of the superior rectus? It elevates the eyeball, lifts it upwards, right? The inferior branch is going to supply a muscle right here, and this muscle right here is called the inferior oblique. I'm going to denote it I-O. We'll see it again a little bit later here. It's going to go off another branch, which is going to supply this muscle here, and this muscle I'm going to denote as I-R, inferior rectus. And then there's another branch that you can't see here. It would actually be here in the back. We'll see it in a different view here in a second. But it's going to go to another muscle called the medial rectus. And we'll see that in a better view in just a second, okay? So, superior branch goes to the levator palpebra superioris su and also goes to the superior rectus. Inferior branch goes to the medial rectus, inferior oblique, and inferior rectus. Okay, we'll highlight these functions in just a second. But let's take two more views at the eye, okay? One is I want to get another look at the inferior oblique. So, this muscle up here, we'll talk about this when we talk about the trochlear nerve. This is actually called the superior oblique. This one down here is called the inferior oblique. Now, if you look here, the inferior oblique is actually coming from the medial side, like the na nasal side, and coming underneath the eyeball and attaching to the inferior lateral portion of the eyeball. And then when it contracts, it does something really interesting. It pulls from that portion and it pulls upwards. And when it pulls it upwards, it pulls the eyeball upwards and rotates it outward. So it pulls it upwards, so it elevates the eyeball, and it rotates the eyeball out laterally. So it does what's called superior and lateral rotation. All right, that's really cool with the inferior oblique. That's that view. And again, we'll talk about the superior oblique with the trochlear nerve. A nice little acronym uh, someone once told me was like this, LR6, SO4, and A, um, all the rest, ATR3, okay? LR6 means lateral rectus, sixth cranial nerve. Superior oblique, fourth cranial nerve. And all the rest, third cranial nerve. Okay, so it's just an easy way to remember which nerve supplies which muscle. Okay, so that's that view. Now, imagine I'm taking my eyeball and I'm trying to look in the back of this, this eyeball here. I'm trying to look all the way in the back posterior part of the orbital cavity. This is what I'm gonna see. And just to be really specific, again, this is the posterior wall of the orbital cavity. This could be like the temporal side, so the temple side. And this over here would be towards the nasal side, so where the, the, the honker is, right? Now, <clears throat> what happens is, and I'm gonna mention the structure because it's important. There's this blue ring here. You see, see this hole right here? This is just a superior orbital fissure. So this hole right here is actually the superior orbital fissure. So superior orbital fissure. Just looking at it from the actual posterior part of the orbital cavity. This right here is actually called the optic canal. This is where the second cranial nerve runs through, the optic nerve, along with the ophthalmic artery. Okay, so here, I'll put that in there for you too. All right, now, this blue structure here is actually called the common tendinous ring, or the annulus of Zen. So they call this the annulus of Zen, or the common tendinous ring. Why am I mentioning this? Because it acts as the origin for four extraocular eye muscles. Okay, so it acts as the origin for which muscles? Superior rectus. If this is nasal side, this is medial. So this is medial rectus. This is the inferior rectus, and this is the lateral rectus, okay? The common tendinous ring is the origin for these extraocular eye muscles. Also, it separates the uh, superior orbital fissure into two compartments, one with inside of the common tendinous ring and the parts which outside the common tendinous ring. Now, the oculomotor nerve has that superior branch. It's within the common tendinous ring. The inferior branch is within the common tendinous ring. And what else? Uh, if you want to be really particular, you know there's another nerve called the nasociliary nerve, which is actually a branch off the ophthalmic division, which is a branch of the trigeminal nerve. That's called the nasociliary. And then if you want to be even more great students out there, you'll know that the sixth cranial nerve, abducens, runs right within the common tendinous ring also. And then if you guys want to be great, you can remember that there's actually going to be the lacrimal nerve, frontal nerve, and trochlear nerve. 
Someone once told me liver function test. Lacrimal nerve, frontal nerve, and trochlear nerve, or the fourth cranial nerve, run within out the uh, supraorbital fissure outside of the common tendinous ring. Okay? All right, now, superior branch supplies this muscle here and supplies this muscle here. I didn't hit this one. This is just another view of the levator palpebra superioris. And this one over here is the superior oblique. So superior branch supplies, superior rectus, which elevates the eyeball, and levator palpebra superioris, which elevates the upper eyelid. Inferior branch supplies the medial rectus, which causes adduction of the eyeball or medial rotation of the eyeball. And it supplies the inferior rectus, which actually depresses the eyeball. And then it also supplies the inferior oblique, which actually elevates and laterally rotates the eyeball. Let's highlight these functions here. So what is its functions? So if we take here, third cranial nerve, okay, has how many branches here? It has a superior branch, it has an inferior branch, and if we really want to be particular, we'll do it in the same color as that nerve, it also is going to have those parasympathetic fibers. So it's also going to have those parasympathetic nervous system fibers. Okay. What was the function of those parasympathetic fibers? They were to cause, they were to affect the iris. They control the pupil size. Okay, specifically they go to what's called the sphincter pupillae and cause it to constrict. And it controls the ciliaris muscle, okay, which controls the lens. Specifically the accommodation of the lens, which basically helps with near vision. Superior branch supplies superior rectus and levator palpebra superioris. What does the superior rectus do? It basically elevates the eyeball. Levator palpebra superioris does what? Elevates the upper eyelid. And then the inferior branch is going to be supplying the inferior oblique, inferior rectus, and medial rectus. Inferior oblique elevates the eyeball and rotates it laterally. Inferior rectus depresses the eyeball and rotates it medially. Medial rectus adducts the eyeball or medially rotates it. And if you really want to remember, superior rectus also does not only just elevation of the eyeball, but it also can medially rotate the eyeball. All right? That's the third nerve. All right, sweet deal. Something else I want to talk about with respect to these parasympathetic and somatomotor fibers, to be really, really particular. They are running right next to each other, but to even be very, very, very specific, they're actually running in another way. Let me highlight it like this. Imagine here, I have like a tube, okay, like this. And then inside of the tube, I'm gonna have something else. Here, all this stuff in black. Look at this, this is a beautiful design, okay? That black part is the GSE fibers. Okay, the somatomotor fibers. All this stuff around it in blue is going to be the parasympathetic fibers or the GVE fibers. Why is that important? Because there are certain clinical correlations to this that we'll talk about in just a second as we go through all of them sequence by sequence or along the course of the nerve. But again, what are these uh, blue fibers here? They're the GVE fibers. They're the parasympathetic fibers. So parasympathetic nervous system fibers. And these ones over here, the black ones, are the somatomotor fibers. These are the ones that are going to the extraocular eye muscles. The GVE ones are the ones going to the ciliaris and the uh, sphincter pupillae. This does have some clinical correlation to it. One other thing is there's blood vessels that supply this. You guys might remember this when we talked about it in the cardiovascular system. Uh, there was what's called the vasa vasorum. It was basically the vessels that supplied vessels. This is very similar, except instead of it supplying vessels, it supplies the nerves. So they don't call it the vasa vasorum, they call it the vasa nervosum. Okay, so it's a tiny microsystem of blood vessels that are specifically supplying the actual somatomotor fibers. What is this actual vascular system here called? The vasa nervosum. So it's a beautiful thing that is supplying the actual, primarily the somatomotor fibers, the microvessels. That also has a little bit of chemical correlation to it. All right, sweet deal. We covered a decent amount so far. 
We've talked about the origin. We know where it's located. We talked about its course. We talked about the structures that it supplies and their functions. Now let's do some clinical correlation real quick. Okay. So step by step here, let's say that we talk about different types of lesions. We talk about nuclear lesions. Okay. So inside of the brainstem, then we talk about peripheral lesions. So along the course. Okay. Nuclear lesions. This is where I wanted to take some time to talk really briefly about what's called Weber's syndrome and Benedict's syndrome. Very hard to uh, separate image-wise. You have to look at certain symptoms a little bit differently. Okay, so what are these two different types? One is actually called Weber's syndrome, and the other one is actually called Benedict's syndrome. Okay, so this is interesting. This is an interesting one because you have to look for certain types of other symptoms within the individual. Really quickly, do you guys remember where the oculomotor nerve is? Good recap. On the sides of the pericoductal gray matter. What's right next to it? Say it out loud at home. Parasympathetic fibers. What's on the sides of this? Medial lemniscus. Over here, medial lemniscus. Just because we already put it like this, what structure, even though it should be red, what's right here? Red nucleus, which is for the rubrospinal pathway. Then we had another structure right here, anterior to this, and this is going to be the crux cerebri, and the crux cerebri is gonna be specifically where the descending corticospinal fibers are. And then last but not least, it's located at the level of the superior colliculus. All right, sweet goodness, we got that. Now, if you remember, we said that the third nerve might run this way, out like this, and out like this, right? Parasympathetic fibers, same thing. They're gonna come like this, and then they're gonna come like this. There's two different types of nuclear lesions that could develop, whether it be due to some type of infarction, a tumor, an abscess, whatever. Demyelination of the axons, let's say, that there was a lesion that developed right here and another lesion that develops right here, okay? So two lesions have developed. We have to differentiate between which one it is. Okay, for the anterior lesion, the one that's affecting the oculomotor nerve as it's exiting, and it's affecting the crux cerebri. You have to remember, what was the crux cerebri carrying? Descending corticospinal fibers that go into our actual muscles. It's a motor pathway. But if you remember, we might have talked about it briefly certain times, these fibers actually come down to the pyramids and they cross over, and then they come out to whatever skeletal muscle they're going to supply, right? So this would be affecting, if you damage right here, you'll be affecting the actual muscles on the contralateral side of the body. So you might develop what's called contralateral, and if you have this weakness of the muscles, it's called paresis, and if it's damaged completely, it's called plegia, right? So we're just gonna say that it's weakened, let's just say. Okay, but again, it could progress to becoming completely damaged. So it's called contralateral hemi, actually it's the shade, let's say it's damaged. You fricked it up, all right? Contralateral hemiplegia, all right? So again, what is, could I, if you're damaging these fibers right here, these actual somatomotor fibers and parasympathetic fibers that are coming out at that level, this would be affecting the oculomotor nerve, but they don't cross. Since they don't cross, this is gonna cause the same side of the extraocular eye muscles to be affected. So this is gonna be called ipsilateral since it's on the same side. So ipsilateral, and which nerve is damaged? Third nerve. And because of that, it's going to cause this palsy, this actual weakening of the muscles. How would that manifest? How would you see someone with third nerve palsy? What would they look like? Would they be, you know, all kinds of contorted? Let's see. I want you guys to remember something. Superior rectus controls a little bit of medial rotation. Inferior rectus, medial rotation. Medial rectus, medial rotation. And then inferior oblique is a little bit of lateral rotation, but not too much. Okay, but it also controls elevation, so we'll put elevation here. A little bit of elevation. Now, and the superior rectus is elevation of the eyeball. If you lose the function of the superior rectus 
inferior oblique, inferior rectus, medial rectus, what are you primarily losing? Well, I'm losing elevation of the eyeball. And I'm losing medial rotation, medial rotation, medial rotation. Huh. So if I can't bring my eyeball in, it's probably going to start wonking outwards. If I can't bring my eyeball up, it's probably going to start wonking downwards. So what would the eyeball look like? Let's say that the right nerve was damaged. Let's say that the right third nerve was damaged. So let's say this is the right eye, left eye. Let's say that the right eye is affected. It's going to go down and out. So you're going to see the eye going like this. Okay? It's going to go down and it's going to go out. Okay? So when you see third nerve palsy, you might see a down and out movement of the eye. One other thing, what other nerve is affected here? The parasympathetic fibers. If they can't affect the pupil, what does the pupil do? The pupil is actually responsible for constrict, it's actually, I'm sorry, the parasympathetic constricts the pupil. If they can't constrict the pupil, what's gonna happen? That sucker is gonna dilate, right? So their pupils are gonna become fixed and dilated. So what else will we see? Let's just basically give this guy like no iris here. Look at this. All right, look at this. He's got a heck of a pupil hole, right? So now he's gonna be fixed and dilated. So not only down and out movement, but it might even have fixed and dilated pupils. Okay, sweet deal. So that's what we see with this person. Now how do I differentiate that from the other guy, the Benedict? Which is spelled weird, but that's, believe me, that's how it's spelled. Benedict. Benedict syndrome is actually going to be the damage within the posterior part, which was damaging what? It was damaging the third nerve, it was damaging the medial meniscus, and it was damaging the red nucleus. So how would this manifest? Remember, right away, the third nerve is damaged. It's always ipsilateral then, okay? So it's going to be ipsilateral. Third nerve, palsy, okay? Next thing, remember the medial lemniscus? We might have talked about it sometimes. It's actually going to have, its fibers are going to come downwards. This is an ascending pathway, actually. So if you were to, let's say that we're actually having proprioception from the same muscle here. Proprioception from this muscle, whether it be from the muscle spindles or the Golgi tendon organs or the joint kinesthetic receptors. It's gonna move up what's called the dorsal spinothalamic tract, and then it's gonna get up to the medulla where the nucleus gracilis and the nucleus cuneatus are. And then what's happened is it's gonna cross over to the opposite side. And it's gonna come up here, right? So if I damage this medial lemniscus, I'm gonna lose loss of proprioception and touch to the actual area on the contralateral side. So I'll have what's called contralateral loss of sensation, which is like hemianesthesia, and maybe even proprioception. Okay? Last thing, I'm affecting their red nucleus. Now the red nucleus, let's pretend now that I bring it down here in red. I'm going to bring it down here in red. It actually comes downwards and then it well, actually crosses right away. And it goes to the other side and goes to these distal limb flexors. So same thing with this guy. It would actually cross over, come downwards, and go to the distal limb flexors. If you damage the red nucleus, then you're going to have contralateral, actually what? Weakness of the, uh, the wrist flexors, right? Some of the wrist flexors. also. Because you're damaging that, this person develops what's called tremors, what's called flapping tremors. So that's another sign because of the rubrospinal pathway being affected. So they have what's called contralateral limb weakness, distal limb weakness, or hemiplasia, if it's completely damaged, and produces flapping tremors. All right, sweet deal. That's that one. Another thing, what if I actually developed peripheral lesions, superior cerebellar artery, develop a barrier aneurysm, posterior cerebral artery, but develop a barrier aneurysm. I compress the nerve. If I compress the nerve, I might lose function of it, right? Excuse me, what else? Let's say, you know there's a temporal lobe right here? There's a medial part of the temporal lobe called the uncus. Sometimes what can happen is, Due to high intracranial pressure, the uncus can actually herniate through a small little space. Okay, due to high intracranial pressure, maybe someone has an intracranial bleed for whatever reason, 
Now, high intracranial pressure can actually cause an uncle herniation, and the uncus can compress the third nerve, and that could also cause problems. What? Usually it's going to first damage the actual uh, parasympathetic fibers and cause fixed and dilated pupils. Later on, it actually might cause the down and out movement. Also, it's running in the cavernous sinus. So for whatever reason, let's say that this was this artery here. This was called the internal carotid artery. Let's say that for whatever reason, someone develops an aneurysm of the internal carotid artery. That could compress the third nerve. Or the cavernous sinus, it could actually get infected. You know, if there's like meningitis, that could actually maybe flare that up. Or if you have what's called cavernous sinus thrombosis, okay? Which is actually a thrombosis of the internal carotid artery. Or maybe if some type of infection actually spread to the area from maybe the actual uh, paranasal sinuses. Okay, and then last thing is maybe some type of trauma. What if you actually got blasted in the face by someone and it actually uh, broke the actual, maybe the part of the orbit or the superior orbital fissure and it actually compressed these actual nerves also. That could also cause that problem too. Last but not least was this whole vasonervosum. I didn't just mention it for the fun of it. In certain situations like diabetes, mellitus, they have microvascular changes like aneurysms basically, little microvascular aneurysms of these little vessels, these micro vessels going to the actual somatomotor fibers, right? So in this situation when someone has diabetes mellitus, it could actually damage the somatomotor fibers by causing these microvascular aneurysms, which affects the blood supply to the actual somatomotor fibers. So what would these people develop as a result of this? They'll develop that down and out movement of the eye. Another one is people who have high blood pressure. Very persistent high blood pressure can also cause this too, hypertension. Very chronic hypertension, okay? So, Ninja Nerds, in this video we covered a lot of information about the ocular motor nerve. We covered a lot of stuff. I really thank you guys for sticking in there and watching this video. If you guys enjoyed, please hit the like button, comment down in the comment section, and please subscribe. As always, Ninja Nerds, until next time.